Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the channel. Do we need him? I'm here with Loki and we're going to uh, discuss Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata's second movement, or as I said in the first video, his quasi una fantasia, uh, I'm mindful of the comments about the pronunciation, quasi una fantasia, number two, the second like a fantasia sonata that Beethoven wrote between 1801 and 1802, so right on the cusp of the 19th century, the dawn of the new century. It's very symbolic, this, because Beethoven, right at the beginning of the new century, is pioneering the new Romanticism. And this ties in with a number of comments on our previous video, where people have asked, how does the second movement fit in to the sonata? It doesn't seem to quite work given the wonderful romantic poem, sombre and mysterious first movement, and the absolutely terrifying and tempestuous finale. How does the, the middle movement work? You know, there it is. It seems to be this curiously urbane and almost old-fashioned classical piece wedged between these two uh, sort of iconic romantic pieces. And the truth of the matter is that Beethoven, as a person of his era, is of course straddling two kinds of world. He is a composer who's been brought up uh, as a child of the 18th century, and he's been trained within the steel galant or the late 18th century style. His heroes, or his teachers, are in a sense Mozart, though Mozart died before he actually gave Beethoven lessons. But Haydn was literally Beethoven's teacher in the 1790s when he came to Vienna. He hoped to study with Mozart. Mozart died in 1791. So when Beethoven arrived in 1792, he had lessons with Joseph Haydn, the most celebrated composer in the world at that time. And they had lessons. Haydn was a, a huge fan of the young composer. He'd already written to the Elector of Bonn to say that the young Beethoven was hugely gifted. But in fact, they didn't get on very well and the lessons were not a big success. Beethoven was resentful of Haydn's criticisms of his more tumultuous C minor style. So when he published his Opus One piano trios, for example, Haydn said, oh, you want to watch out with the C minor one? It's a bit too turbulent. <laughs> and Beethoven was having none of that. And he was kind of right, because the C minor style was what marked him out as a representative of the new, the new style, the new generation. So Beethoven is, all the way through his career, to some extent, wrestling with this kind of dichotomy between the new pioneering romantic tendency in his own work, which itself is, I suppose, a response to the world as it was beginning to turn out in the 19th century, you know, post-French revolutionary world, a world where liberalism was a new force, and there was a kind of a, a new turbulence to the political and hierarchical social order. And Beethoven represents that in some sense. The Moonlight Sonata is a piece that's right at that point where his own style is tipping towards the, the epic middle period style. And the middle movement is perhaps just a little bit with one foot in the 18th century. So with all that in mind, I want to uh, read from a, a comment received today. And I love uh, so many of the, your comments. Thank you for, for the many uh, lovely, generous things that you say and occasionally for the critical things which we are mindful of and we're, we're working on improving the channel as we go along. But this is a lovely comment and a very insightful comment. I have a theory, says Isaac, that the whole sonata, all three movements, are a processing of Beethoven's grief over his hearing loss through expressing his emotional depression, funereal first movement, his faltering interactions with the outside world, the offbeat minuet, and the tumultuousness of handling all these external expectations in the rapid final movement. It explains Beethoven's specific instruction to move directly between movements as though they're one cohesive message. Really interesting and suggestive of a sort of biographical element to the sonata. Now, I don't think that's at all fanciful. I think the old fashioned view of Beethoven as an abstract composer whose work exists in some sort of 
perfect platonic region of pure thought is actually nonsense. <laughs> uh, we know that some of his pieces are specifically autobiographical. A great A-flat sonata, Opus 110, it now turns out, has particular autobiographical meaning, which we may get onto in a later video. But The Moonlight, I absolutely agree with that comment. I think it is a very personal response, specifically to his own traumatic encounter with hearing loss, something that Beethoven was absolutely, we know this from the, the Heiligenstadt Testament, the document that he wrote at that time, which is almost like a will. It's like a mixture of a will and a suicide note, where he's saying, you know, I'm, at times I've considered ending my life. He's so horrified at the prospect of facing the rest of his career with decline in his hearing. So this was utterly traumatic. I mean, imagine being a musician of any kind, let alone a musician of the extraordinary capabilities that he had, and very much a performing musician. You know, Beethoven was a pianist. Gradually, as his career progressed, he had to give up being a performing musician. So here he is confronting this problem, which is why, yes, it's perfectly possible that the somber funereal first movement is in some sense a reflection on the loss of this absolutely significant thing. And the second movement, now the suggestion in Isaac's comment is that the out of kilterness of the middle movement is also in some sense autobiographical. Well that's also very interesting. Let's talk about this. The second movement is, and this is 18th century, it is essentially a minuet and trio. Several of Beethoven's early sonatas are in four movements, and the third movement is always either a scherzo or a minuet. <laughs> thing to say about minuets is that it had become a very standard kind of dance genre by the end of the 18th century. You know, you, you get minuets all actually all the way through the 18th century because you get them in Bach suites, for example, or Handel suites. So they were a thing already in the Baroque era. And then they, they follow through into the late 18th century with the new forms, symphonies and sonatas and so on. And the minuet is the one element of the old suite that continues through. I guess because it's a movement in 3-4, it's a triple dance, it has a kind of light quality and a humorous quality. And by the end of the 18th century, Haydn had pioneered a new kind of funny minuet. He even invented the idea of a scherzo, which Beethoven picked up on. So really the answer to the question that many of you have posed, what is this movement about? It is really, as Liszt once said, Liszt described it as a flower between two abysses. <laughs> so you've got the first movement, which is this extraordinary and famous thing, dark, somber, funereal, mysterious piece. The last movement, which is unprecedentedly furious, I don't think any keyboard piece, any piece for forte piano yet written had conceivably compared with the fury of the finale. So you've got these two very extraordinary outer movements. And then Beethoven in his sort of late 18th century mindset would have been of the opinion, what we need in the middle is a lighter thing, a moment of respite between these two enormous sort of pillars that hold up the overarching structure. Now, it's very interesting because Beethoven did write several two movement sonatas. There are the early, early Opus 49 little sonatas in two movements. And then of course, the late ones, the very last sonata, Opus 111, is two movements. Normally the two movement structures, if you have a minor key sonata with Beethoven, he would normally have a minor key first movement and a major key second movement. Whereas here you've got two minor movements and very, very dark and no relief from that. The relief comes in the middle. This is what the middle movement's all about. It's like allowing a moment of humour and uh, elegance and dance to come into the, the form. So it's very interesting because of course the instruction is that you end the first movement with the arpeggios and they, dar they, they drop to the bottom of the piano. You've got the pedal down, this very, very dark, resonant, sound coming out of the instrument and then Beethoven says continue without a pause so we go straight into the, the minuet and the dance kicks off it's important to remember that in a dance movement because you've got dancers not literally but in terms of what a dance is it's always a regular rhythm it tends to always fall in eight bar sequences and that's what we have here 
But the fascinating thing is the way in which Beethoven disrupts the normal sense of phrasing and the normal rhythmic relationships within the movement. So in terms of the way the phrases work, let me show you what they consist of. So you've got a da 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 rhythm. First of all sustained, da 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 And then the answer phrase, da 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 Actually the same rhythm, but staccato. So you have a sort of dialogue, if you like, between sustained elements or legato elements and articulated or staccato elements. Here's an interesting thing, though. Beethoven, in his late music, uh, introduced an idea called ritmo di tre battute or ritmo di quattro battute, which is <laughs> rhythm of three bars and a rhythm of four bars. You get this in the Ninth Symphony. He writes it out specifically in the scherzo movement. And it's also a feeling that you get in some of the late string quartets and you get it even in the Seventh Symphony, although he doesn't write it specifically over the score. But the point is this. In a minuet, you'd normally have ritmo di quattro battute. In other words, a rhythm of four bars in a row. I'll show you how that might work. The beginning of the minuet, you've got one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And that's how it's often played. However, I think that Beethoven's using a more Mozartian type of phrasing here. In other words, the first bar is, is as it were, the fourth beat. So, four, one, two, three. If that's the case, I'll show you why I think it. Because if you look at the middle section, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Now, I think that it only makes sense if it's phrased in that way. The middle bit, if you phrase it in the conventional way, if it's this, one, two, three, four, one, two. Why is that sport sound in there? Three, four, one. It sounds wrong. It's awkward and unmusical, frankly. <laughs> so, so I think Beethoven's dealing with this fascinating ambiguity of phrasing, and the whole piece is slightly off kilter, as our marvelous comments suggest. Here's another reason why it's off kilter. You've got this rhythm. In other words, straight, long, short, long, short, long, short rhythm. But here. Everything gets disrupted. The longs go on the offbeat. So we've got long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short. So the sort of slightly jazzy vibe kicks off, these syncopated rhythms. And that continues as we go forward. Here, almost a hemiola. In other words, one, two, three, one. the syncopation in the, in the answer phrases and then a big syncopation on the accent a little after phrase a sort of Mozartian close straight into the trio now I should say the Moonlight Sonata is slightly curious in that the same prevailing tonality runs all the way through C sharp minor and then the enharmonically related D flat, the enharmonically the same key, D flat, notated as D flat because it's easier to notate than C sharp major. And the trio section of the minuet is also in D flat major and is also full of syncopated rhythm. So it's curious, the trio section flows out of the minuet. It's not really a different character. However, it is different insofar as it's a pastoral. In other words, there's a character trope here that Beethoven's playing with, and that's the idea that you get in the pastoral symphony, and you also get it in the pastoral sonata. You'll remember in the wonderful pastoral sonata that he wrote shortly after this. You have this. You get these lovely sort of funky rhythms and... and um, slightly drunken rhythms actually with drone-like uh, character. It's the same here. There's a drone, a drone of a fifth which Beethoven puts a big accent on 
and we've got a dominant pedal. So there's a dominant note there. things off the beat and you've got these lovely pastoral drones then he goes around the circle of fifths with a chromatic descent and now we get a tonic pedal with that wonderful almost i don't know bluesy vibe it's got this terrific kind of tread to it a slightly swung uh, rhythmic feeling and all the chromaticism as well magnificent and uh, and the whole thing with these two pedal points a dominant pedal and then a tonic pedal so in other words the whole trio section is almost like a perfect cadence with an emphasis on the dominant note the da, that note and then a little middle bit going around the circle of this and then a da. so the whole thing is like a sort of huge cadence and then we return at the very end da, to the anacrusis and back into the, the new act. so that's the middle movement of the moonlight sonata and yes it isn't the great romantic character of the outer movements but it's full of elegance and wit there's a shakespearean quality to beethoven he mixes together the tragic and the comic in a way that is somewhat shakespearean and, and beethoven i think was aware of it he was often talking about Shakespeare and, and even one or two of his pieces, the Tempest Sonata, for example, specifically inspired by Shakespeare. So here we have it, a tiny little comedy, slightly mysterious, melancholic comedy almost, but comedy nonetheless, with a pastoral at the centre, and then you plunge back into the, the second abyss of the finale. So... Now, you'll hear a recording of me playing this. I recorded this a while ago on a forte piano. So you'll hear the, the very end of the first movement and how that joins into the minuet because the effect of the two in juxtaposition is very much what Beethoven had in mind. So I've recorded the two next to each other. You'll just hear the end of the first movement going into the minuet. Enjoy. 